come to the seventh convention here in Flensburg. Um, as you probably see, I'm not in the studio. I'm unfortunately in my home office. You know that um, special times have special um, things going on. And unfortunately, I had a Corona COVID contact earlier this week. And until recently, just uh, exactly 30 minutes ago, I didn't have my test result. So I didn't dare to go from Berlin to Flensburg. I really regret not being there because as you probably all know, I'm coming from Flensburg originally. That's my hometown. And that's the reason why I would have loved to be there in the studio and basically be the whole day um, here and join you from the studio. However, you know, in these days, everyone has to be flexible. And we are at the end of virtual and digitalization um, society that we go into. And especially COVID, I think, showed in many different regards how digitalization and uh, virtual events can uh, really start through and go through the roof. And I think we learned all about that over the last month. So now being here in my home office in Berlin, um, not in quarantine anymore, but have been until recently. So let's do it from here today. So again, a warm welcome. Um, thanks to the music again, a warm welcome to everyone who's joining. Um, I really, really love this event due to many reasons. Um, first of all, um, I'm a startup person. I will tell you a bit about my background in a few minutes. Um, but being a startup person, um, I completely um, came to value the whole um, motivation and enthusiasm that goes out from entrepreneurs, from startup founders. And originally, when you think about Berlin or Denmark, you think about Copenhagen, you think about Berlin. But I think it's great to see, especially as being someone from Flensburg, that there's really also at the University of Flensburg, but also on the Danish side of the border, there's really like a little scene um, being created. And I think these events like the Conventure are really putting a huge emphasis on that. And that's the reason why I'm very happy that this event, even though due to Corona, takes place. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today and lead you through the day. Good. So um, quick words uh, from the beginning, just from an administrative viewpoint, um, you know all that hopefully you have your login to the Hopin tool. That's actually where everything is happening today. So if you haven't done it yet, um, hopin.to is the way to go. And this is actually the tool where everything will happen today. Um, and that's the reason why hopefully you're already on it. If not, um, please log in now. And um, we actually like quickly start the day with a quick introduction, which I'm already doing right now about myself. And then we actually go directly into the um, greetings from uh, two politicians from both sides of the border. I'll come to that um, just after my introduction. And then we immediately start with the startup talks between me and some uh, great founders from the region. So what is my role and why am I here? And what is my background? So my name is Finn and um, I'm from Flensburg, born already in 1982. So from a startup perspective, uh, not one of the real young founders anymore, but I have been, I would say, a founder almost at least by heart through all my life. Um, born in 1982 in Flensburg. Um, the first company I actually founded was in 2000. Um, it was a sports online marketplace called sportssecondhand24.de. Um, funny enough, it didn't go too well, um, but I think everything has its time. Maybe back in the days I was ahead of time. It was me and three guys from the Flensburg, uh, Flensburger Förde Gymnasium, the um, high school on the east side of the city, that back in the days had the idea to start like an online marketplace for secondhand sports gear. To be honest, I actually think if I would found it today, um, there would still be a market for it. And that's 20 years later. So um, obviously the idea was probably a bit of ahead of time back in the days, but really like my entrepreneurial roots line Flensburg. Also a lot of different things connect me to Flensburg. I mean, back in the days I started to be politically active. I was the president of the German youth parliament in Flensburg. Um, I basically um, did my first lessons in web design in Flensburg. I was actually working as a web designer um, beside school in a small agency in Handewitt, which is like, uh, if you study here in Flensburg, you know that it's just very close to, to the city. And also what really, I would say, characterized me as a founder was in 2001, um, when I did my high school, school exam, we had a certain project with, the, um, with, my, with my high school where we had the opportunity to see an IPO of a local company from Flensburg, uh, which was called back in the days Data, Data Safe AG or Data Safe, uh, Data Safe AG from this, which you might know, 
which was basically a small company that decided in the new dot-com bubble um, in 2001 to IPO. And we back in the days had the opportunity as part of our high school exam to go to Frankfurt and saw the IPO live there. And if you think about, or if I think about what made me really becoming an entrepreneur, it was always probably these things that were happening through my youth in Flensburg. Like the first idea with the online marketplace, it was the IPO. And I think at my university time back in the days, that was actually less inspiring. And uh, back in the days, I did decided not to study in Flensburg. I decided to study in Freiburg. That's a small little uh, town in Saxony. And um, it was a conscious decision because once that I did my high school exam in Flensburg, I decided that I also wanted to see something else. Um, and back in the days, there was still um, a, a national authority that sent you wherever you didn't want to go uh, when you did your high school exam. And I landed, I ended up in Saxony in a small town called Freiburg. It's in the, it's uh, very close to the Czech border. And that's actually where I did my studies. And the funny thing is, if I think back to my studies, which were 2000 until 2005, startups or founding your business or all these kind of things, they were not really a topic. And uh, I did actually everything myself. I did my first internships um, during my semester breaks. I was actually getting engaged in the local um, student consultancy that were actually consulting small com companies um, um, in the area of, uh, of Freiburg and Saxony. And that's probably what really characterized me and made me enthusiastic about being an entrepreneur after I left Flensburg. I think today, if I look at the University of Flensburg or the Fachhochschule or the, 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 the University of Applied Sciences and also the, the universities on the Danish side, I see that entrepreneurship has a much bigger value on the curriculum of the university than it had a few years ago. And I'm very happy about that because one thing I'm sure of is that the entrepreneurs today will be the backbone of tomorrow's infrastructure and the backbone of tomorrow's economy. And that's the reason why I can just recommend everyone to really found your own business and be brave and do it because at the end of the day, there's nothing more exciting than founding your own business. However, if you think about myself, um, after I finished university back in the day, still with a good old diploma and not with a master or bachelor that was unfortunately directly after my time. Um, it took me also a while to do really the step. I started my career going directly to the Boston Consulting Group. I have been a um, consultant um, in Germany, the US and Australia for almost five years. And even though I always had this entrepreneur DNA in me, it took me a long while to really be brave enough um, to really decide to leave like the, the nice and warm atmosphere of an employee who gives you the fixed salary, who actually pays you all your trips to really decide that I really wanna go outside that safety and go outside and do something myself. And it, was, it took me actually almost four years until I was brave enough. And now a few years later, looking back, what was my biggest regret? I think I should have left my secure job much earlier and really do something myself because there's nothing more rewarding than building up your own business. And I know many of the people who are listening today, they either want to do their own business or they're already doing it. And I can just recommend it to everyone because that experience is really something that is almost like a roller coaster. It's uh, probably the ups and downs and it's definitely nothing for everyone. And there are probably always people who, who want to be in a more secure workplace. But for me, it worked out very well. I loved really being an entrepreneur. And to be honest, now being 38, um, I can't imagine doing the, anything else during my life. So what have I done in terms of entrepreneurship? Uh, after my safe time at BCG, I've been to um, Rocket Internet. They were the first people who approached me back in the days in Australia to say, hey, Finn, uh, what about actually doing something outside the safe job? What about you found the Zalando of Australia? And back in the days, you know, I was 28, uh, Rocket Internet, Oli Zamver, maybe some of you know him by name, and called me directly and said, hey, um, I heard good things about you. We want to build the same like Zalando in Australia. Are you in for it? And I think after four years really thinking about, do I want to do my own business? What can I do? Like, do I have the right idea? Back in the days, Rocket was probably the thing that I needed to, uh, to de finally decide to leave my safe job and do something. And that's also the reason why many people who are not liking Rocket Internet too much, I'm probably one of the ones who are really thankful to Rocket Internet because I think by convincing people like me to enter the German or European startup scene, 
um, I think that was really a kickstart of the whole startup movement that you see in Europe right now. And I think Rocket Internet did a great job for that. I founded the Iconic, uh, which is, as I said, the Zalando of Australia. I did it two years. Now it's part of the Global Fashion Group. It's a company that's listed on the stock market in, in, in Frankfurt. Um, the Iconic now has more than 5,000 employees and does more than 500 million revenues. At the whole Global Fashion Group, more than 2 billion with more than 2,000 or 3,000 employees. So obviously that was my really big experience um, in the beginning where I realized what you really can build. If we start from scratch and you basically have nothing but a small um, storage area in an in a, in a uptown area that didn't even have electricity and we were sitting on camping tables. And now suddenly out of that company that I know I founded about 10 years ago, you suddenly have more than 2,000 employees. You do 1 billion or 2 billion revenues and you're listed at the stock market. So that is really something you can be proud about. And obviously not every course as a founder goes that way, but it shows you one of the many ways that the way as a founder could go. And I think that's something that inspires me every day to really do more because it's almost like building a house. When you put the first brick down, you don't know exactly how it will look like at the end. But then suddenly a few years after you look back and say like, wow, um, this is really what I built. And very often it fails. But to be honest, what I'm always thinking about our European, um, our European thinking is we should be rather proud about what we built. And also if we fail to take it as a learning and, and, and build it again, instead of just giving up. So after the Iconic, I went to Pro7 Sat1. I wanted to come back to Germany. Um, I actually, funny enough, missed my friends and family in Flensburg. So I decided for me that it was the right thing to go to Berlin. I worked for the biggest German media um, company, Pro7 Sat1. Um, the Germans among you know it, the Danish uh, guests probably not that much. However, it's the biggest German TV network. Um, and this TV network was very much inspired of what Rocket Internet is doing. And they decided to build up their own incubator called Epic Companies. So during that time, we built up companies like Amorelli um, that we invested in and helped building up. We did companies like Valmano, which is an online store for, for watches and jewelry. We did Gimondo, which is an online gym, which in the beginning, uh, which by now I think it was almost the kickstart of other companies following like Rantastic or, or all the different companies that, that actually came afterwards. However, um, one big thing that I always wanted to do is found my own business. So maybe inspired by um, my background in Flensburg and my love for the beer that was brewed here, I founded my own brewery, the Berliner Berg Brewery, uh, which is still one of the bigger craft breweries in Berlin, invested by Jägermeister, uh, which I never did full time, but that was actually also something that I wanted to do myself. And then I came to my probably biggest startup experience and the toughest one so far was actually the C being the CEO of Movinga the online moving platform, which is active in Germany, France, and, um, and Sweden. And it is the market leader, but by the time I overtook it, the founders made two high promises to the investors. In the end of the day, the investors found out that everything what the founders told them was not necessarily 100% true. And my task was basically for four years to restructure that company, bring it from 800 uh, employees almost down to 100 and now back to 200. And that was, I think, the toughest experience I had, where I'm always thinking like uh, my mom always told me, um, Finn, you're one foot in prison um, and the other foot is still there. Um, you should decide which direction you want to go. However, like uh, as something that probably it's very northern German, at least I like to think about it like that. We are very stubborn. So I like to um, do that. And my big aim was to restructure that business. And really after four tough years um, and a lot of actually sleepless nights, um, this was probably the experience that at the end was most rewarding because I was able to save the company. However, what also happened afterwards, I was really thinking myself, I saved a company that I didn't found myself. And that is something I wanted to change. And that's the reason why end of 2018, I decided to leave Movinga. I gave it to new hands. I raised another financing round. The company is, even though Corona is not easy for the moving industry, very stable. But then I think we talk about this later on. I founded the Sanity Group. And the Sanity Group is basically an online, it's not only online, it's a cannabis company. It's at the moment European's leading cannabis company. So it means we do everything around cannabis, from medical cannabis in the pharmacies to basically consumer products like Vi. You might have seen the advertising in TV or in Flensburg in the out-of-home posters outside. And that is actually something that's very close to my heart. And now uh, you might think that I might be a consumer. Um, I leave that uncommented, but why is it close to my heart? 
because even in 2002, I was one of the main activists in Flensburg and I was going on the streets and I remember that I was demonstrating for the um, legalization of cannabis. And even though I was a member of the Young Union, like the conservative young wing of the CDU, I was probably one of the only ones who was for a legalization. And when in 2017, Germany decided to legalize medical cannabis, I thought now is my time to really do something myself. And that's what I'm doing today. And I guess we have the opportunity to talk about this later on. But I don't want to talk too much. Uh, I think my 15 minutes are over. <laughs> so uh, one thing I do still, and that's actually close to my heart, I'm a member of the German Startup Association. I'm a member of the management board. And that is also why I'm very happy to always support startups and future founders going forward. Um, and that's the reason why I'm, again, very happy to be here today. But now I actually want to talk um, about other things than me. So I mentioned in the beginning, we have two greetings of politicians um, that couldn't be here, unfortunately, because, you know, it's a special situation. But we have one from the German side, Bernd Buchholz, um, our traffic minister from Schleswig-Holstein. And then we have Benny Engelbrecht, um, the same from the Danish side. And uh, to not bore you too much with me talking all the time without interruption, I will hand over to the video team to now um, play the greetings done by the two politicians that are very helpful of this whole event. This year, we were supposed to celebrate the German-Danish friendship. 100 years of peaceful and flourishing cooperation across the border. Most of the celebrations were canceled, but that doesn't mean that the cooperation has come to a halt. There is a lot of potential in our border region. Over the last years, especially the startup community has grown constantly. Key players like the Venture Warft are important to connect the entrepreneurs, universities, business owners, supporters on both sides of the border and to offer a platform for exchange. Germany has seen a decline in newly founded businesses over the last months. In Schleswig-Holstein, however, the pandemic had a different effect. The numbers rose. Apparently, our young founders are not afraid of the uncertain development these days. That's rather impressive. Supporting creative minds and turning their business idea into reality is an important goal for us. That is why we organized the fourth startup camp this year, where we offer mentoring and training for 10 startups from Germany and Scandinavia. We also support the Water Country Festival that is established as a vibrant meeting point for startups from North Europe by now. The interactive event provides a unique transfer of knowledge. To foster this transfer and enhance the networking possibilities, we also support the association startup Schleswig-Holstein that connects universities, research institutes and startups. We want to establish an environment where choosing to build a startup is simple. We need innovation and creative ideas in Schleswig-Holstein and therefore we need startups. This event is yet another step on the way towards founding spirit and cooperation across the borders. Thank you for organizing this event and I wish you a fruitful exchange at this fantastic event. Hello all, uh, moin as we say in Zunabor, uh, for those of you that live across the border, guten tag. Now, I'm really pleased to be a part of Convention and as Danish Minister of Transport, of course, I'm very interested in how we can promote innovation within the transport sector. Let me give you two examples, a small one and a big one. Let's start with the small one. The Danish company Nimbus made motorcycles back in the early 1900s. It was a great thing. They were noisy as hell, but they were really popular. They're still popular, actually, in these days. Only nowadays we really want something that's not noisy and that doesn't pollute as much. So an innovative young guy uh, found a way to produce this motorcycle as an e-bike instead. Also actually as uh, an electronic bicycle 
I bought one of the last ones. I'm really looking forward to 2022. But it just shows that it's possible to make innovation and raise fund foundation even for small ideas like that. And now the big idea in Denmark. The big idea is to produce uh, the, the future windmill farms out in the ocean on separate islands. So we are going to have artificial islands in the middle of the ocean that only produces uh, clean power that will uh, generate the future power to X, the electronic fuels that will be put into, for instance, airline uh, flights and, uh, and the commercial shipping and so on. That's really innovative. I don't know what ideas you will come up with, but I hope it will be something that we can be proud of and that can uh, elaborate and strengthen the collaboration across the border. I hope all the ideas that you come up with are great ones. Have a good day. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Moin. So, thanks so much for the nice little greetings. Uh, and I think, to be honest, it's something that's very close to all of our heart is the German-Danish friendship. And I think we do something that's very unique. Uh, and we do it for a long time already here in Flensburg in northern Germany. We have a very good relationship with our neighbors, which is growing every day. You see it at the university. You see it at the everyday um, going over the border and helping each other. And I think that's also something that both the politicians stress very much positively in their greetings. However, I want to actually move to the next part. And as you can imagine, today um, is a full program. You will see that on Hop In or the program that we have today. But one of the main things uh, we want to do is to have a startup talk uh, between me and also founders from the region. And I'm very happy to welcome in the studio, um, besides everyone you already saw on the screen, Daniel, who is the founder of Check My Next, like a really nice startup from the area of Flensburg that I was uh, having the, the pleasure of meeting um, last year already. Uh, he will tell you in his pitch in a second exactly what he's doing. But I'm also very happy to uh, welcome Peter from Swings, also a very innovative startup from the region. Um, you will see what he's doing. I don't want to take too much upfront. But the next topic will be um, all of us, like me, Peter, and Daniel, will introduce their startups with a small video followed by a 60 seconds pitch. And then afterwards we go into the um, into the discussion. But before I talk again too much, uh, welcome <clears throat> Peter. You're number one. Your pitch can actually start now. Can you hear me? Nobody can hear me. Can anybody see me? Take over to you. Thank you. Are you ready now? Can I hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, that's great, Finn. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you for the introduction and even uh, for the small break. So I'm ready. Well, that's right. I'm Peter. I'm from Swings, and I invented the foot swing, as you saw on the video. It is like that. 
Nobody is made for sitting still, and yet we have made it like uh, the whole society where we have to sit still. Nobody is able to focus and concentrate if they have to sit still all day long. As a teacher for 13 years, I experienced that a lot. We, we make the children sit still, but they are not able to focus and concentrate because they have a burning energy inside of them. They want to move. So that's why I invented the swings. It's a foot swing where you easily mount it underneath the table and it gives the user uh, the opportunity to move quietly and not disturbing others. In that way, um, the user can again focus and concentrate and I as a teacher can teach without being disturbed by the others and the, the user can also um, learn and focus a lot more. We are now um, at 25% of all schools in Denmark use this foot swing and we are ready to launch it out uh, in the whole world actually. Um, yes, that's the small pitch for the foot swing. Cool, thank you so much, Peter. I think it's a really interesting business model and it's really like typically thinking outside the box. So it's a problem that I guess many parents and many teachers and many children have. And I think it's a very innovative solution of how to fix that. Thank you. So um, I would say let's go to the next video. Uh, thank you, Peter, again. Now it's about Daniel and you will tell mm -hmm. us more about Check My Next, but not before we start the next video. Du hast also online gerade deinen absoluten Traumwagen gefunden. Super Bilder, alles Sahne. Aber weißt du, ob der auch technisch einwandfrei ist? Und wenn er viel zu weit weg steht, kannst du den ja auch nicht unbedingt angucken oder Probe fahren. Und deswegen bist du hier genau richtig. Check mal Next, schick einen Sachverständigen zu diesem Auto und lässt ein aussagekräftiges Gutachten erstellen. Und schon weißt du Bescheid. Link einfügen, Gutachten auswählen, Daten eingeben, bezahlen. Fertig. Das war's schon? Ja, einfach. Wir checken deinen Nächsten. Check my Next. Yeah, um, can you hear me right now too? Yep. Perfect. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Daniel. I'm the founder of Check My Next. And um, before Check My Next, I work as a car mechanic. And often family and friends ask me to help them checking their new used car. Um, well, that basically means driving through Germany to check them and you mostly don't know if they are in a really good condition. Um, one day I asked these friends again, which problems do you have when it comes to buying a used car? And which were mostly the same, like the lack of knowledge, hidden damages, untrustworthy car dealers and the long journey to reach attractive cars. And Checkman X is here to solve this. Um, we offer a full service platform when it comes to buying a used cars. That basically means um, we can check cars all over Germany. Um, we have special expert for this. We can deliver cars, we can register them, and we can finance them. And the best of it is um, you don't even need to move from your couch. Um, you can just book us digitally, and we do all the work for you. Thanks. Good. Thank you, Daniel. Cool. I think a very, very good pitch. And now, uh, last but not least, actually about myself. And I think also we play a little video about my company and then within se uh, 60 seconds or two videos about my company and then within 60 seconds I try to explain you in a nutshell of what we are doing and then I think just directly we go over to our startup um, talk. But uh, let's watch the videos first and listen to my pitch. Finde deine natürliche Balance mit CBD Produkten von Bay. Mit dem CBD gehen nach dem Sport. Den CBD-Mundspray für Momente der Entspannung oder den Nachttopfen mit Hanf und Melatonin für den Schlaf. Bestelle jetzt versandkostenfrei und völlig ohne Risiko auf wai.com. Wai, this is the good stuff. Relax. Yeah, so that's my 60 seconds. 
So if you look at our today's society, uh, you see that basically we have um, more and more tendencies towards stress, towards not having enough sleep. And if you think about in the 90s and early 2000s, it was all about being faster, sleeping less, uh, doing more, doing harder. And I think when you look at the last years, you see that there's a new trend coming. It's like people are going into spas, people are doing yoga, people are doing meditation. And I don't think that this, this is because people think meditation is something that they need to do because it's cool. It's, I think, because there's a trend in this world that makes us more stressed and uh, less relaxed. And if you look at the numbers, um, the amount of people who are having mental health issues because they sleep too little or they can't sleep at night or because they're mentally distressed, this amount of people goes up for almost 15 years in a row now, almost doubling every five years. And while meditation and yoga is a great stress relief and a natural remedy for your stress and your better sleep, um, there's one plant, and you probably know what this plant is, that was basically stigmatized for more than 60 years in our society. But the more you look into this plant research-wise, the more you see that the plant can actually do good for people. And that plant is the cannabis or hemp plant. And what we do with Buy, and this is like our main brand for consumer products, we want to take the best out of the hemp plant. And that's, for example, the cannabinoid called CBD, but also other cannabinoids called CBG or CBN. And we really design products that help people relax at home, that help people to have a better sleep, and that also help people to recover after their sport. And these are really the things where you have scientifically proven results of that plant. And in our opinion, that's just the beginning of the cannabis plant and how much it can do. And Vi is the first brand that really goes out there and actually makes it available. You find it in Douglas, you'll find it in, in other retail spaces, you find it online. And we already have a great success story behind us, but our mission remains to really show everyone how great the cannabis plant can do outside the drug image you might have, which is mostly connected to THC. And that is the reason why we strongly believe in that plant and we do everything to make the good characteristic of the plant available to customers. Good. I think these were the three videos and the three pitches. And I would say now let's hand over to the startup talk and um, let's go into the discussion. Peter. Yes, Finn, how did you get the idea to get into the hemp production or not the, the products of hemp? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned quickly in my introduction that uh, back in the days, even in Flensburg um, in 2002, I was, let's, I don't like the word activist, but I was basically already um, really interested in the plant because I saw back in the days that it has a lot of medical value. And what wondered me during the time back then is when I looked into the plant, that 99% of the population only think about cannabis as a dangerous drug. And only very, very few people are thinking about cannabis as something that can really help people from a medical perspective, from a pharmaceutical perspective, from a mental health perspective. And that was the reason why I already went on the street in 2002 and fought for a legalization, uh, first medical. And when Germany legalized in 2017 and suddenly the first research results came in about how great cannabis can also do, that was actually the moment where I decided when I was sitting one day at Movinga, where I decided, do I want to be one more time an entrepreneur and really do something that I believe in? Or do I want to remain a manager in a company that was not founded by myself? And that is actually a reason, the reason why, um, why I decided to go into this area and really founded something that's close to my heart. And that's basically something around the cannabis plant and what it can do good for people. But now I have a question in return. I mean, uh, as I mentioned already in the beginning, uh, it's a very um, out of the box thinking your swings. And I was just wondering, how did you get this business idea? So what made you do that? How actually did the idea come up? Do you have children yourself? And what kind of role did your professional background that you had before doing that played in finding the right idea of founding your own business? Yes. Uh, well, um, as I said earlier, I'm a teacher and it was actually in my classroom. I had a student who was very restless, moving around all the way, all the time. But he had his feet was on a football, so he placed his feet on on top of the ball, and then he would he was canalizing and channeling all this energy into the ball, so he could still sit still uh, over the table and and focus and concentrate. But underneath the table, his feet was moving, but the ball was would roll away or uh, disappear in the lunch break, 
And so that's, that's why I came up with the idea to mount uh, something underneath this table. I actually mounted first a metal plate, but it was making a hell of a noise, like an old bicycle, but it, it, it worked for the, for the boy. So, and then I made a, a wooden plate instead. Um, I actually left it there and, um, and it solved the problem for the boy. Then after some time, I had more colleagues. They came and said, hey, that problem or the product you produced for that boy, can you, can you make some for us? Because we have a similar child in this other classroom. And then suddenly uh, uh, I realized that I had uh, invented a problem, uh, a product which was scalable or it, 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 I just had to produce it actually. So, so it, uh, in, in that way my profession came uh, in use. <coughs> but I earlier also worked uh, for Danfoss in, in the in industry, uh, in the production. So I had the production uh, lining was very close to me. So it was easy for me to, to invent and make a, a, a proper project. Um, so um, yeah, well, uh, that's it. And that's the story about the product. Um, yeah. Yeah. Finn. To be honest, I love it, and I think what you what you just described is the perfect example how everyday small little problems that probably ninety nine percent of the population just accept as it is without wanting to change it mm -hmm. can get actually changed if someone takes it up and says, "I want to make it good." And I, that's the reason why I really love the idea and see how you solve an everyday problem with at the end such a simple idea but on the other hand very innovative and out of the box so uh, really really i love it but on the other hand daniel i mean also to you i mean uh, having like something um for your car i mean it's not for many an obvious idea of like about car selling and i mean there are already platforms online so how how did your idea come and what did your background um, bring into that kind of idea and, and what was your process of of really um coming up with that idea to found check my next uh, yeah, like I also said um, at the beginning, um, I work as a car mechanic and so I know the pain points from people who want to buy a used car and um, I was just talking to friends and family and said to them, hey, maybe you find someone on the internet who can help you with buying the used car. Maybe you find someone who can check it. And um, I got really quick the answer that there was no one who um, offered this service online. Um, so I decided just to build this platform on my own because um, there are so much cars and so much people who want to buy cars online. And I think also right now, also in the time of Corona, um, you can travel through Germany and there are so many um, problems when it comes to buying used cars like around Germany when you're from Flensburg and your dream cars in Munich or Berlin. Um, so I think there, there was a big need um, just to invent this platform. And that was basically the reason why we why we tried it and i think we have a pretty pretty good product right now cool so and i think to be honest you already have a product i mean you launched the website quite some time ago you have some amazing and some of them we just saw or one of them we saw some amazing spots around it but obviously like i mean since it's very normal in startups in the beginning when you have a good product market fit to grow I was wondering, how do you handle the growth? Like, how do you, first of all, how do you grow? And how do you make sure you grow? And then also, what's your experience with grow? Like, how, how are you handling it? Uh, yeah, um, we started a big uh, marketing campaign, like on social media, YouTube, um, Google Ads. Um, we created like three commercial spots with um, a company here also in Flensburg von Dorsch, um, which are pretty nice. You can see them on YouTube. Um, I, I really love them. Um, and on the other side, we try to build up a B2B sales channel for um, like car dealers, uh, online platforms, leasing platform, etc. And um, that worked pretty nice. So um, we realized pretty early that the people like the product. And we, since the first day we are online, we had bookings for the product. I think that's, that's also not a normal way. And um, on the other hand, the B2B sales um, started also pretty early and we had a good, good start in the market. So. Um, how do we handle that? We're right now hiring people for marketing and, and B2B sales, and we, we start growing right now. And um, yeah, that's, that's the way we handle it right to until now. Good, and I think one other question is like that probably everyone's wondering about, especially when, when you have new young businesses being founded. Um, one question is always the money, right? So do you finance it yourself? Do you bootstrap it? Do you use VC money? Do you have angel investors? So I think if you, 
say what you said. I mean, you need to create a website to do that. You need to have like a platform that's connected to actually um, all the mechanics to make actually sure that you can um, do what the platform needs to do. So how do you finance that? And actually, do you need to finance it? Like, does it cost money? Or you said in the beginning, all your spots, social media, I mean, that also went viral. But if you think about doing advertising and, and building your website, how did you actually finance that in the beginning? Uh, we thought we could bootstrap it, <laughs> but it didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, so, so we tried to, to found investors and we have two family offices um, who are invested in Checkman X right now, um, who gave us the money for um, build up the platform, start the marketing campaigns and like start growing um, because building up a platform is pretty expensive. Um, you need money for the marketing, for the sales, for the platform itself. So there's there's a lot of money you can spend if you <laughs> if you want to. And um, like you also know, marketing is pretty expensive. Like YouTube, Google, uh, whatever. There 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 are pretty high prices if you want to have like um, good advertising banner on on Autoscout or Mobile or whatever. Um, you have to pay a lot of money, and that was the reason why we thought we need two investors or one investor for that. Okay. Yeah, I think it's always a question of philosophy that you have, like, and it really depends on the business model, like how much money you need. But I think yeah. actually it sounds like a very um, solid thing. But, you know, very often, and that's my experience as well, you think you can do something for very little money and then suddenly it costs more. It's very rarely the other way around. <laughs> so um, in very many cases, financing is necessary. But yeah. talking about financing and about growth, Peter, I mean, Swings has been all over the news. I thought in the German news, it was on Arte, the German French TV channel. You were in the Danish news. I think if I'm not mistaken, you won the Red Dot Design Award. I did. So, yeah. I mean, obviously you have a lot of um, lot of feedback already. So how do you handle growth? And what's your, like, and how many markets are you? And how do you think about expanding your business going forward? Well, it, we started in Denmark uh, actually only using social media to, to have that. Uh, the problem with the foot swing is that uh, we actually know that 15% of all children actually would benefit of using it, but nobody else knows it. So we have to tell the story about the good benefits of using a foot swing. And uh, we've done that on the social media in uh, Facebook a lot in Denmark. So uh, in that way, we, we, we gained 25% of all schools in Denmark. So in, in that way, we actually used the money uh, to, ref um, yeah, to reuse or to reinvest in, in other marketing uh, material. So, uh, so, so far, I financed it all myself or the company and um, but we also had the red dot helping us uh, it's backing up our product and reliability and uh, we also i also um we made an um what do you call that <laughs> um yeah. cooperation with a with a danish well a very big danish company uh, who has a license agreement on uh, one of the small foot swing um in that way um I, I secured some of the sh um, chain line, uh, supply line for, for production in China and, um, and also for distributors and uh, resellers uh, around the world um, by actually giving away some of the, um, some of the small product in a, in a license. Um, yeah, so okay. that's it. And so what do you plan going forward? Do you plan to finance it yourself or do you want to raise a financing round at some point? To I think uh, what we are looking for right now is more uh, the, the dif dif different accesses into to other countries like Germany right now where we, we want to uh, go in for the school market and also for the office market. Um, and um, I think... Uh, We'll, we'll get there later <laughs> or sooner yeah. or later. Uh, we are, have actually started on Amazon, um, so, uh, but we need the marketing and the resellers uh, for the product. Uh, yeah, so that's what we're looking for now. Okay. Good, yeah, if I think about myself and uh, how Vi is growing, I mean, it's a very different oh, yes, story. Sir. So, I mean, you both are um, more or less bootstrapped with, a, with some angels who came on very on top in the beginning. If I think about Vi and uh, Sanity Group, my company, 
I mean, obviously, when you're found for the fourth or fifth time and you're already in the VC world, it's uh, very often the case that um, that it's almost normal for you to take VC money. And sometimes I regret it because whenever you talk to investors, um, you sometimes regret that you have them on board because you would really love to decide everything yourself and not ask them for permission. But on the other hand, for example, with why we did the other way around, we took a very big financing round from the beginning. We were actually talking to our investors and really tell, told them about our plan to basically really become one of the leading cannabis companies. And that actually happened by getting a financing round very early in the beginning, actually three months after start, where we had like already like a small round of big German VCs. And when I say small, I mean in comparison, small to later rounds, which was already 4 million euros. And that's actually something that at the end of the day is really the question of what kind of way do you want to go and also probably what kind of business model do you want to pursue. So for example, at Vi, as I mentioned in my little pitch, um, maybe similar to you, Peter, but also at the end, similar to you, Daniel, you need to explain what the product is doing. Whenever you are innovative and you do something new, you need to explain um, why your product is necessary, why your product is good. And sometimes this takes more money, sometimes this takes less money. But uh, it's very interesting to hear about what you uh, what you have experienced in terms of financing, in terms of growth, because in the end of the day, every growth story is different. You will always find similar similarities between different companies and some are bootstrapped, some are financed, some are some are kind of a mix between the two. Um, however, what really interests me as well, and that's actually something that I would love to ask you, Daniel, first, because you mentioned that already a bit in your in your statement having founded the company here in Flensburg, but now actually traveling a lot through through Germany. So if you think about the region of Flensburg and where you are now and where we are basically all virtually or physically um, in this moment, how important was the region for you and did it play a role in the foundation? Or would you say no matter where you were, if you were born in Japan or South America or, or uh, somewhere else in Germany or in Denmark, you would have gone the same path? So what do you think was the role of the region in your decision to found something? Um, we had a really good backup here in Flensburg. So um, I, I'm studying at the, at, the, uh, at the Hochschule here in Flensburg and um, they have like a, a small part of it. It's called the Doc 1 where you can um, like ask questions if you are a, a founder and they help you like um, with which way you can go, where which people can help you. They, they start. Um, like thinking about about your idea with you and um, they just support you in every way and um, that was one big point for for me just to to stay in Flensburg though that we have we had a big support here um, we have a lot of partners here where we started with and um, I also have a family and a small child so um, so we that's one of the biggest reason we stay here um, but nevertheless like you already said I'm traveling a lot of through Germany um, the last weeks I was a lot of or the last months I was a lot of um, in, in Nordrhein-Westfalen and Berlin. And um, if you compare these startup culture, um, it was, there, there's a really, really big difference between, between them. Like um, like we, when I was in Cologne, it's like they are heavily pushed. They, they, they want to try the exit. And um, here in Flensburg or, or Northern Germany, um, it's all a little bit smaller and they are calmed down and you can just start a little bit relaxed. And um, that was, I think, one of the points why we are still here. Cool. And now, Peter, I mean, the same for you. I mean, you decided to stay in the region, uh, the region, the region uh, with swings. You didn't move to Copenhagen or any other big city. It's really interesting for me to also see. I mean, you mentioned your history at Danfoss and maybe that uh, as being a teacher um, also in the region, but I would also love to hear from you a bit more about what kind of role the region really played in you becoming a founder of your own company, Swings. Like, I mean, you mentioned already your, your background in school, but also the region would be really interesting for me to understand a bit better. Yes, I think it was, uh, it was an obvious choice to stay here. I had a lot of help from Sunabau Evaxeter Service and um, it was really competent and also from other companies both to uh, make prototyping and now on also to uh, easily uh, to make my finished product and um, and also helping deve developing the product so I think um, uh, the region here is superb for that and I don't see then any reason for my product to to become a Copenhagen product it is not going to help uh, the sales is just gonna 
make the expenses uh, explode because I'm gonna pay a lot more for a house uh, rent and, and something like that. Uh, it's this uh, internet business, I can have it uh, all over. So, um, and it's perfect here, it's, it's close to Germany and that's gonna be my next uh, key market. So it's, it's just uh, very good for me to stay here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to be honest, like uh, I always tell myself the next venture I'm founding will be also up there in Flensburg. Uh, it was just out of, not out of, out of laziness, but I mean, if you're once in the track of being in Berlin, you obviously have your network here, but I can completely understand the reasons. And if I have the choice again uh, after Sanity Group, uh, maybe, um, or not maybe, most definitely I'll come back to Flensburg and I will do something in the region for sure. But another question that I actually see, I mean, also um, in terms of the future, we talked already a bit about growth, but, you know, startups are always unpredictable. So to a certain degree, you never know what happens. I mean, if you would have asked travel startups one year ago where they will be in 2020, they probably have a different answer to that uh, than they have now with all the corona craziness starting and really making it tough for a lot of startups. However, I mean, as a founder, you very often have a vision of where you want to go. And I was just wondering, maybe, um, Daniel, you first, uh, where do you see Check My Next in the next five years? So what's your vision? Where do you want to be? Where do you see the company be? Um, we just talked about that the last weeks. Um, I think the best way for us would be um, if we can present Check My Next like the number one platform when it comes to buying a used car, like your bodyguard or your best friend when you are trying to find something who can deliver the car, who can check it, who can register it. Um, whatever, it, um, it, it's not, yeah, we, we are not um, really focusing on one product, so we just want to help in every way. Um, so we want just to be like this, this big buddy or the, this, this best friend you, you're ever looking for when you need someone who's helping you. And um, I think that's our goal for the next five years. Cool. And Peter, what do you think about the future? Yeah, well, uh, also, as you said, it, it's so difficult to know uh, where, wherever you are. It's, it's, I, I, nev I never would have guessed that we, the, focus, the foot swing now is available at Amazon in Mexico. So I couldn't have told you that a half year ago. So, but in five years, I believe this, this company will be uh, well known worldwide. Um, for the for the foot swing, and we will have other similar products with with help children and grown ups with uh, focus on the concentration in a functional way, but also with a focus on design. Um, yeah, so that will be it. Yeah, I mean to be honest, it's always a very interesting question because to be from an investor perspective, and I have been in very small circumstances also being an investor, and that is something that always tells you how visionary and how enthusiastic are the founders about uh, their vision in the future. And I think both of you had very good answers. And uh, when someone asks me, I always say, I want to be the leading can cannabis company in Europe. And when I mean leading, uh, yes, obviously also leading by revenue, ideally. But one of the things that I really believe in, and I mentioned that in my pitch as well, is for example, in my um, case, the cannabis plant is so new and people just started researching it about 10 years ago. And I was just uh, in summer, um, I love to tell the story because, you know, as I mentioned before, you actually see it, it's a bit dark, but you see actually the little picture also over my shoulder, it's Flensburg. So the region is very close to my heart. And that's the reason why I try to source as many cannabis as I can from the Flensburg region. And I talked to a farmer, like a organic farmer, who's, who's, uh, who's actually growing hemp, not the THC hemp, but the hemp that's strong on CBD. And I asked him, why is he thinking about, um, farming cannabis and he just said for me and he's very religious i have to say that um he said for him it's the pharmacy of god um because there are so many different ingredients in the cannabis plant that have a pharmaceutical impact on the body but also in a good way and he as a religious person has experienced in so many different ways so he calls a pharmacy of god however what i love to do with the sanity group is bring it back from <laughs> religious belief or mystery to really scientific facts and that's also the reason why i think we don't want to want only be leading the cannabis industry by revenue in five years, but we want to be the ones that are really driving research. And that's, for example, my big vision for the company. Good. So um, now we have some time left, um, not too much, but we can probably go one or two minutes over. 
and um, the floor is open for questions from the audience. And uh, I have to, unfortunately, because I'm not in the studio, I have to juggle with a lot of different screens open at the same time. However, um, I'm now switching to the screen in Hopin, where you already started the first questions. So um, let's go prepare the questions, Steffi Oizad. So the first question that I see is from Ken Thompson. What was your main concern and main positive when taking an investor on board? Um, I don't know who wants to answer that. Daniel, do you want to answer that, Peter, yeah. or should it be me? Who feels most comfortable in answering that question? I can do that. Um, yeah. For us, it was the reason because we, we, we know that building up a platform costs a lot of money. So um, we were not able to bootstrap it. Um, so we had to find a way to finance that. <clears throat> and that was one of the reasons why we thought about finding like um, a family office or an investor or whatever. And for us, um, we found a strategic in investor. He is who is also working um, in the in the car industry. So um, for f we had a lot of insights. We had money, so it was the best way for us just um, to start growing and get new ideas and other perspectives. Um, for us, it was a really good way to to go to go like that. Cool. So for me, to be honest, uh, because I always take investors on, uh, I can answer that quickly for myself. Um, it's it's always a bit of like good and bad. So similar to what Daniel just said, um, you really not only want money from your investors, but you also want your investors to help you. Um, so that means ideally you go for investors who already have a bit of experience and who can actually also support you, maybe even during bad times. Um, hopefully you never have it, but uh, it's very unlikely that you will never have bad times as a startup, unfortunately. But this was actually my ma main topic. But the biggest concern is always, and this is actually something I wouldn't underestimate, if you on a personal level don't get along well with your investors, that can turn into a problem later on. And that's something when I take new investors on board that I don't know, that's always my big concern of uh, of do I really want to work with this guy in the long run? And do I really want to ask this guy for permission for my own company if something might not be as positive as it, as it is? And uh, I have the simple rule. Um, if I have the luxury of having more than one investor that I can pick from, my final question is always, can I imagine uh, drinking a beer with this guy on a Saturday evening or do I rather stay away from him? And when I decide he's a guy that I like to drink a flens with on a Saturday evening, then I probably can also handle difficult situations with him. So that is something that is actually my advice to founders. If you take money, take it from good people. Good. Then uh, next question. I think, Peter, that's maybe a good one for you. Uh, how did you find your team or um, did you start everything by your own? And if yes, um, like what kind of people did you pick to help you from the beginning? Uh, what kind of like uh, profiles were you looking at? Was it more opportunistic or were you everything doing by yourself? Tell us a bit more about how you how you approach ho this whole team and employee and, 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 and that kind of aspect. Yeah, well, I think um, in, the, in the beginning I did, did everything myself. And but it was uh, it was really fast uh, that I needed people, um, and I think um, also like you, it is important when you find people that you can uh, actually s maybe have a beer with them or at least uh, yes you don't need to be friends uh, but you need to to trust the people who's close to you and 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 where you work with and the way. Um, I, I also hired a lot of consulant uh, uh, because then I wouldn't be uh, what you call uh, locked on on salaries. It's it's more like to 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 get the job done um, by professional help um, in some of the the bigger business uh, bigger cases. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did I answer that? <laughs> no. Yeah. Cool. Daniel, how did you do that? Um, it's it's mostly the same way like Peter did. Um, I started on my own at the beginning and I realized pretty fast that um, I cannot handle all that stuff alone. So um, that was one of my first questions I, I asked myself. Um, how can I just build up the, the platform? Who's doing the marketing? Stuff like this. Um, that, that was one of the reasons um, why I um, asked a friend of mine if he wanted to come within my company um, just to support me and, and do this stuff I don't know. 
And um, right now we are also growing. Like I said, we are hiring in sales and marketing. And um, yeah, it's, it's like you said, we are looking for people who are um, passionate for the business and for us and who, who like the company and who are staying behind the product. And um, it's a hard way to find these people, but if you find them, um, they, they're the best um, workers you can, you can have. Yeah, I strongly agree with you. I mean, to be honest, there's nothing more important in an early stage startup than having the right team. Yeah. And uh, also what you said, Peter, coming back to my statement with the investors, I mean, one thing is for sure that um, when you start a startup yourself, you have to be very tight, like you worked on, on problems every single day. You don't know where it's going. It's almost like a journey. And uh, that's also the reason why I think you should always pick people that you're happy with to take on that journey um, and that you can trust on um, and rely on also in, in, in times that are not so good. And for me, everything in the beginning is transparency and being honest and open. And, and I always look for people um, that are that are man that are actually manageable in that way, and, and that are really, as I, as you said, Peter, they don't have to become your best friends, but since you spend probably most of your time with them, uh, they should be at least bearable and uh, and good people. Good. So we are running a bit out of time. However, I think two more questions um, um, I see straight away. I will actually see if I see more. Uh, maybe we answer three more questions. One is very um, quick from Dirk Ludewig, um, and that's to me, so I keep it short. From your extensive experience, what do you miss in the support landscape in Schleswig-Holstein? Yeah, so I, I could even talk two hours about that, <laughs> but I will spare your time. Um, to be honest, Berlin is not, like from a support perspective from the government side, like the mayor of Berlin or the government of Berlin, I don't think that they are really supportive, uh, in my opinion. I think, to be honest, they are to a certain degree almost arrogant, saying, ah, we are the capital, the startups come anyways, there's nothing we need to do. And that's the reason why the power of Berlin is not its government, it's not the support uh, that you get from any official areas. The power of Berlin is the network. Uh, I said already three years ago that there's not a single night in Berlin where you don't have five meetups taking place somewhere in the city about founders meet up, um, CMOs meet up, marketing meet up, online marketing meet up, where people just meet together to drink a beer and, and exchange ideas. And the second thing is in Berlin, because, and that's kind of like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, because you have, have already so many founders that sold shares, sold their business. So there's, for example, Robert Gens, the founder of Zalando, he sold his shares, uh, is now like a, a multimillionaire, and he's an angel again in new businesses. So I think that network is is something where big cities where you have a lot of activities are benefiting from. However, I strongly think when I look to Schleswig Holstein, and I was just a few weeks ago, um, and Daniel, you were there too, of the German Startup Association of the little um, virtual talk um, with some founders from Kiel mainly, but also other regions of Schleswig Holstein. I have the feeling that these networks are slowly but surely also developing in our hometowns. So um, I think if you would have go 10 years back, Berlin would have been the only city in Germany where you have kind of this network. In the USA, it would have been the Silicon Valley. And I think since Schleswig Holstein is really keen on doing more, I think we are very lucky that the government is trying to do things to foster that network and everything similar to universities with the DOC1, DOC2, and the regional, uh, the regional um, associations. However, at the end of the day, what really fosters a network is success stories and people who support each other. And I think the Convention today is a perfect example for that. Uh, there's many more. I think the, the, the uh, Ferdepreneur that we had last year was another amazing example of, of really bringing together founders. So I think that is something we need to work on, and you do it already very well. But that is really something that will strengthen the support network much more than any, any government could. So long answer to a quick question. But now I think we have time for maybe two more. Um, the next one is from Katharina. Uh, I really like that question, and I give it back to also uh, maybe Daniel first. Has there been a situation where you wanted to give up? And that's actually, I think, a perfect startup question, so I love it. <clears throat> but uh, I also give you my two cents later on. But Daniel, uh, you have also very fresh startups. Was there ever a moment when you thought, fuck it, I give it up? Uh... Not really. Um, oh, wow. of, of course, it's, it's, it's a pretty hard time sometimes and um, you're often struggling. 
but if you're not passionate and you are not into your product that much, then you don't need to, to follow that way. So um, I never thought about giving up. That's, that's, that had never been an opportunity for me. And Peter? Well, well, same as Daniel, I never thought of giving up. I, um, sometimes other people said I should give up. I, there was once where my manufacturer went bankrupt, uh, so, and I lost a lot of money in that bankruptcy. Um, so that's that's. But I, I survived and I managed to get out of it. So um, I learned, I learned a lot about it. So sometimes learning is uh, is a good thing, but can be expensive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I always love to say one little anecdote from my uh, life, and that was actually when I was the CEO of Movinga. And as I mentioned to you, it was more or less a restructuring case that I took over from the founders. And the problem is that Movinga was really bad in the press um, after this whole thing happened. And as you can imagine, um, a company that already has between 500, 800 employees, it, it needs a lot of money to sustain. Um, so it basically means in, we needed investors. And the thing is, because the, the press was so bad, there was no investor to be found. However, I'm a natural optimist. So I told my CFO, who was really like yin and yang with me. So he was my natural counterpart. I told him every single day, Florian, no worries. We will get investors. We will get investors. Um, it's just a question of performance. We need to show that we, that we are good. We need to come out of this uh, deep valley. But we will get investors. And then I remember it's about, I would say four years ago, it was 2016, um, the first year of the restructuring. I wanted to go home for Christmas. It was, I think the 20th or the 18th of December. And Florian, my CFO told me, Finn, we're really running out of money. If we don't get investors, we get insolvent. We have to file for bankruptcy. And I again said like, ah, Florian, come on, it's Christmas now. Let's talk about this after Christmas. We will find investors, I'm pretty sure. And then he told me, on a Friday before I wanted to leave home for Flensburg, uh, he told me, let's get at least to a lawyer and let him explain the situation. So you know what, you, what you're buying into right now by, by, by being as stubborn as you are. So I said, okay, fair enough. I already had a rental car that I wanted to take to Flensburg directly after this appointment. We went to west of Berlin in a big tower um, and there was, an invest there, there was a, a lawyer in the top. And, and Florian asked me, like, please tell the lawyer the story. I told the lawyer the story. I was pitching, so, you know, everything will be good. There are investors. I'm sure they're interested. And then at the end of the whole pitch, um, my CFO asked the lawyer. So, uh, funny enough, the lawyer was originally from Flensburg too, which I didn't know back then. Um, I asked him, like, so how, or he asked him, like, so how bad is it? Um, and then he looked at me and said, Mr. Hensel, it's not about the question if you go to prison. It's about the question of how long you will go to prison. <laughs> And that was the only moment in my life where I thought, fuck, I, I need to give up because I don't want to go to prison because of, of a mess that someone else produced. But on the other hand, uh, unfortunately, it's like a situation you, you can't stop. You can't go out because when your company is already almost insolvent, um, as every founder should know, you cannot leave the company as a managing director. And that was probably my moment. And uh, I didn't have the chance to give up, so I kept going. But, you know, I think every startup on a small or big scale will always have these situations. And that is something that I think um, it's just about the way how you manage it. And, uh, you know, after every valley, there comes another peak. And uh, I think if you don't believe in it, maybe the founder of a company is the wrong, uh, the wrong choice. But before I talk too long, I think we are 10 minutes over. So unfortunately, there are many more questions and I think we would love to answer them all. However, um, as Steffi already said in the chat, um, you can contact all of us uh, separately. But now I think it's time for our networking sessions. As you can see in Hopin, we have five different rooms. Um, there we will have um, different sessions for 30 minutes. Some are about pitching, others are about the ecosystem. You will see them all on Hopin and see all the details. But one thing I wanna mention as well is that there's a little um, trade fair of where different companies are showing their, um, are showing their, um, um, their products. And uh, Peter is actually part of a uh, yeah, raffle giveaway, so you can actually win um, his swings. You can win his <laughs> um, foot swing. So have a look at his stand to see if you can win one of the famous foot swings. I'm actually really curious to see that product now. But uh, from now on, I will thank you all for your attention. And thanks especially, Peter and, and Daniel, for being here on the stage. Um, as I said, I would have loved to be with you. But now it's the time uh, to switch, from, uh, switch directly to hop in and um, look at one of the five rooms, whatever you like best. 
and then the 30 minute sessions will start from there. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. And I think um, that's <laughs> a sign to stop here and directly switch to Hopin. <laughs>